Okay. First uh, Sunday of 2023. Nope, 2024. See, I'm already... 2024, right? So uh, I thought I would like to share a couple of reflections for New Year. And one of the things that I, I felt that the Lord was telling me was to remind all of us that we have been called to be faithful. So one of the things that... Uh, Let's talk about being faithful today. So I'd like to invite you, if you're able, to please stand up. Let's read from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 to 17. 1 Samuel 7, verses 15 to 17. Open your Bibles if you have a Bible with you. And let's read this together. Verse 15. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also judged Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much. We worship you. We bless your name. We bow down before you. Thank you so much for your presence in our midst. Thank you so much for the freedom that we have in this country to be able to gather together as a church. Thank you so much, O oh Lord, for your favor in our lives for this 2024 that we look forward to your presence and your power in us and in the church. And at this time, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be the one to encourage us, to challenge us, to open our eyes to the truths of your word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. I want to start with a, I want you to imagine a scenario. Let's say you're attending a Christian conference. So you, you walk in uh, to the venue, you find yourself a seat, and it's a two-day conference, and as you take out your booklet, you open it to the page that says Session 1. So after the opening remarks and the welcome, the first speaker comes up to the podium, he's introduced, and he goes to the platform, and he tells a very riveting story of his life. He talks about how he and his wife uh, were basically living the good life. They had just finished their col college. They started a career. They went up uh, in their careers. They were being promoted. And then something shook them. And they, they had this sense, uh, this compelling call uh, to make a radical decision on what he calls the big move. So they sell their house. They sell their car. They, they gave up you know, their things. They liquidated their assets, and they headed out towards a third world country where they opened a Christian youth center. And so for the last 18 years, they've run this youth center together as a couple. And so he winds down his talk by presenting pictures to the audience uh, of the lives of teenagers, teenagers who were orphans, who were prostitutes, who were addicts, whose lives have been transformed through the work that they did in the youth center. And among the faces that you see, some of them have become nurses, some have become doctors and teachers, some of them have become engineers, and so on. And you in the audience, as you're looking through the faces of these people who went through their youth program, he, 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 he begins to end uh, his presentation with a statement by saying, you know, because 18 years ago, we went where God called us to go. We did what God wanted us to do, and all the lives of these teenagers have been changed because we made the big move. And then he gives this challenge. He says, don't let your life go wasted. Be willing to make the big move. He then steps, you know, steps off the stage, and everybody gives them, him, him an applause. And as you reflect on his words, you look at your notes, you look at the, uh, there's an empty page on your notes, and you scribble away a summary. And you write, I want my life to count, to go where God wants me to go, to make the big move. Now, I've sat through presentations 
like that. And I, I'm sure some of you probably have. And they're very motivating. They're inspiring. But I just want to point out one small thing from that presentation. It's not entirely true. What I want to say is that this guy has skipped something. What he skipped is the fact that those kids who came to faith through the Christian Youth Center were not really changed because this couple made the big move. Their lives were changed because of all the work that they did after they made the big move. There's a difference there. Those kids' lives were changed because in the last 18 years, this brave couple left their good life. They boarded the plane to go to this third world country. They opened this Christian youth center. And day after day, month after month, year after year, they poured out them, their, their lives into these teenagers. Now, I'm in no way diminishing the work that God had inspired in the ministry. That big move was important, right? It was brave. It was massive. It was heroic. And, and being obedient to the call of God, it was God's unique call for their lives. But the big move did not cause the lives of these teenagers to change. The big move was just a catalyst. What changed those lives were the slow and steady faithfulness of this couple in the last 18 years. You see, our greatest impact in life often will not come from one jarring transition or one big move, but by bringing in the best version of ourselves to common tasks that we do again and again and again. One author says it this way. He says, to pursue a remarkable life is to take a thousand unremarkable steps. Now, one of the nagging things about the new year is this business of New Year's resolutions, right? What is the resolution that you have for this year? Number one resolution is to lose weight, right? <laughs> so if you examine the list of these resolutions, no doubt it will include goals like, you know, losing weight or to stay on an exercise program, to develop a more spiritual discipline, to, to be more kind, to be a better husband, a better wife, to be a better parent. Probably you never included faithfulness in your resolution. But if you really think about it, <clears throat> if you think about it, faithfulness is really the unspoken requirement of every resolution. Because you will never be able to finish or to accomplish anything without faithfulness. And so today, as, as we stand at the start of this new year, I want us to think about, I want us to reflect, I want us to meditate on faithfulness. You see, here's the thing. Faithfulness is an attribute of God, isn't it? Because God is faithful, we can always count on Him no matter what challenges we face. God is faithful in discharging every aspect of His promises to His people, isn't it? In fact, our salvation and our hope are based on the faithfulness of God. Because He has been faithful, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world to die for our sins so that we can be saved, right? Now, faithfulness, though, is also something that God wants to reproduce in our lives. It's a call for every genuine believer of Jesus Christ as we live in this world. We are called to be faithful. And so for our purposes today, I'd like us to, make, to, to think about faithfulness. I want us to look at a Bible character. There's so many examples in the scriptures of people who have been faithful to God. But this guy is someone that you might not have thought about. He was the last judge of Israel. His name is the prophet Samuel. Now, if you know Samuel, the history of Israel during the time when he was a judge was, was a very difficult period. If you have read the book of Judges, you will know that the people of Israel was going through kind of like a cycle. They would, they would go through a cycle of disobedience, 
And then God would withdraw His hand of protection from them. And then the enemies, their, their enemies will now attack them. And then they will repent. And then God will send them a leader, a judge. And then they will live in peace. And then again, after that, they would disobey again. And then God would withdraw His hand of protection again. And enemies will th- attack them. And then they will, this cycle will go on and on if you have read the book of Judges. Something like seven times. And every time, God will send a judge. So the last judge in uh, the book of Judges is, is this guy named Samuel. Because after him, kings will now become the rulers of the nation. Now, as we look at this passage that summarizes the life of uh, Samuel, we're going to see something about faithfulness of this man, about the faithfulness of this man. And it's going to be really boring. It's going to be very redundant. It's not sexy. It's not interesting. It has to do with that aspect of faithfulness that simply just shows up over and over and over again. And so be prepared to be what? To be underwhelmed as you look at this synopsis of the life of Samuel. We've read it a while ago, 1 Samuel 7, verses 15 to 17. It says, Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. So where did he go? Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah. So he's a circuit goer. Verse 17, but he always went back to Ramah where his home was, and there he also judged Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. So here's her, his circuit. Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and Ramah. And then again, Bethel, Mizpah, Gilgal. And no spectacular military victory. No lightning from heaven. No explosive events. Just a series of repeated cycles of faithfulness. Year after year, Sam, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, would travel this judicial circuit from Bethel to Gilgal and Mizpah to Ramah, and then again and again. In each location, he would provide counsel. He would give spiritual direction. He would hold court as a judge again and again, over and over, round and round. Boring, right? I would suspect that that's what he did when he was 35 years old. Fast forward to the age of 43, he would have traveled the same routes at Excuse me, at 60 years old, pretty much the same. Life on repeat. And these verses are, are, are something, when you read these verses, it's something that you sort of just skip through and ignore, right? Nothing much happens. So we fly past them and then search for the real action. But what we miss is in his going from town to town and year and year to year, is this actually circuit of of this picture of his devotion, of his consistency, of the faithfulness in his life. Now question, is that interesting to you? I mean, if you're bored by that, if if everything has to be new to you, if everything has to be exciting for you, you might miss out on one of the greatest opportunities that the faithful life of a Christian can have, to have impact, to have influence, to have a lasting influence because at the core of the faithful life is, is, is a simple description of a life that goes, and he got up and did it again. He got up and did it again. Now here's the goal, of course. The goal is to bring our best self into our routines, not our cranky selves, not our demanding selves, right? But to be open to God and say to the Lord, Lord, I want to bring my best self into this life. Help me today to bring my loving self, my gracious self, my my patient self, my faithful time into this routine. Because this is about the thousandth time that I'm going to be doing this. From Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah to Ramah. Let me ask you a question. What is your circuit? What is your routine? What is the thing that you do 
again and again and again every day. Do you have one? Is it a good one? Or is it a bad one? Because some people have this circuit of like they go home from work and they play video games for the next seven hours. <laughs> or maybe they would go home and, and they, they would spend three hours on Facebook just scrolling through, clicking, liking, commenting on the pages that they read. Or maybe every day you go to your office and, and you just blurt out all those complaints day after day after day. Yes, you may have a system, you may have a routine, but it's, is it one that's life-giving? Is it, or is it one that leads to a faithful life? So as we face this year of 2024, I think it's important for us to think about faithfulness. Why? Because faithfulness is, is something that God wants us to do in our lives. It's something that God wants us to live in this space as we wait for His second coming. In fact, in the parable of the talents, right, Jesus illustrates this to us. And he tells us that when that day comes, when that day comes when we will be face to face with God, there is one single criteria that God will be looking for in our lives. And what is that criteria? The criteria of faithfulness. For the master to say to the good servant, Matthew 25, right? His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Paul actually says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's what he said. He said, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And so from these two passages, there are many more actually in the scriptures, we can see that faithfulness is something that is called of us by God, and so it is something that you and I must desire and must cultivate more than anything else. We must desire to be faithful more than to be popular, to be faithful more than to be wealthy, to be faithful more than to be able to accomplish things. Most of us desire to, be, to live great lives, don't we, right? But let me just tell you this, faithfulness is a different kind of greatness. It's a journey not marked by the spectacular, but by a strong commitment to something that you do again and again and again. And that means, of course, that this is for everybody. You don't have to be a great athlete or a very rich tycoon or a scholar in order to, to live a life of impact. You don't have to have all of this in order for you to be faithful. The journey is avail available to everyone, to all of us. But here's the thing. The road to faithfulness will not always be easy, doesn't it? It's slow. It's not glamorous. It requires perseverance. It requires an enormous amount of grace and dependence on the Holy Spirit. To be faithful is to do what God calls us to do again and again and again and again and again. So let me give you a couple of lessons, a couple of challenges on faithfulness as we look at the life of the prophet Samuel. And so here's the first lesson, the first challenge is we are called to be faithful in the shadows. Faithfulness in the shadows. When you first read the record of Samuel's life in 1 Samuel, you will read of him as a little child who was offered by his mother to the priesthood. So here he was. He was just brought there. He, he didn't have a choice, right? He was not in charge. He had no position of authority or responsibility. But even as a young boy, 
you will read these words in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26 about him. It says, And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. So you will see here that Samuel was growing up. He was faithful in the shadows. He was just a kid. He didn't have anything to give. But he was growing up and he was becoming, a, a, you know, he was, some, he was becoming somebody in the priesthood. And you know what? When you, thought, when you think about um, life in the shadows, um, if you think, for example, of the performance of a gifted musician, and, and, and you listen to a, a great and wonderful performance, and you're inspired by his music, you know, that is a result of not just hours of practice, but years and years of practice. Some of the greatest musicians, what do they do? What are their routine? They practice something like eight hours a day, don't they? And sometimes when we see something like that, we say, you know what? I wish I could play like that. But while we might wish that we could do something like that, we probably have no interest in practicing to be able to play like that. Something like eight hours a day. Not just for musicians, but for athletes. But for everybody, right? Personally, in my 10 years, as a, more than 10 years of, as a pastor and in the ministry, a lot of my responsibilities have changed since I started as a Bible study leader some 12, 14 years ago, which, you know, this Bible study group which met every week. But there are certain habits that remain the same for me week after week and year after year. Today, I would still sit for hours each day to study, to strive to listen for a word from the Lord, to be able to share it to you. On weekends, I, I stand here, open the scriptures, and share the word of God to whomever would like to listen. Now, I cannot claim to be a great speaker, but if you were here or if you heard me some 12, 14 years ago, you probably would be able to say, he improved a bit. And I'm not saying that with pride, okay? Because in fact, each week as I stand here, I know that I can fail. And I can fall short if not only for the grace of God. But here's the thing. Public performance is one thing. Private discipline is another. Right? I tell our pastors, I tell our elders, that you know, if they are given an opportunity to share the Word of God, that they should take sermon preparation very seriously. Because the most important moments in life may be those times that nobody sees and nobody applauds. That's faithfulness in the shadows. It prepares you to be faithful in the spotlight. So be faithful, even, even if it looks like nothing is really going on, even if it's just in the shadows. That's the first challenge. That's the first lesson. Here's the second one. The second lesson is to embrace repetition. So remember the cycle of the prophet Samuel, right? Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah to Ramah. Then again, Bethel, Gilgal. You know, it takes a while to establish a reputation and a routine, right? And the pace at which faithfulness travels requires really devotion in the journey, isn't it? Goodness demands staying power for us to be able to, to continue. Now, let, let me give you an example. Every church organizes and orchestrates events. And ours are including, including ours, of course. This month alone, we have leaders, a leader summit, as I've mentioned a while ago. Next week, we will resume the small groups and the weekly prayer meetings. On February, we're envisioning a week-long prayer and fasting for the first week. Not to mention, we promote our sermon series. We encourage people to invite friends. We have our creative team who prepares, you know, things for us. I myself would, would spend hours and days just preparing the daily devotionals that you read, uh, that we post every day on Facebook. But here's something that, that you and I must remember. Big events does not grow us up. 
Unfortunately, you and I will not mature in a weekend or after a three-day retreat. There's a difference between a catalyst for growth and the growth itself. And the reality is this. When a big event results in, in significant change, it's generally because of what we do after the event, not, hap not what happened during the event. Isn't it? Because the fact is, good intentions can easily evaporate after an event. You might, for example, sit down um, and reflect on the new year. You might think, okay, 2024, I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to read my Bible every day. I want to be able to lose weight or whatever, right? But it can only stay there if you don't do anything after that, right? And, and you might think, oh, yeah, I've already, yeah, I've already written all of it down. You might think that you have been successful. And you might think that you have already crossed a finish line, right? But here's the thing. From the standpoint of real growth, an event just serves more as a starting point, more than a finish line, isn't it? That's why when you join our five-day prayer and fasting, it does not make you an instant prayer warrior. Because our hope here is that it will become a starting point for those of us who have grown weary in our prayer lives. It will prod us to become more consistent in praying for others and in taking part in congregational prayer. And that happens after the event. When we, what we do, when, when we do that again and again and again and again. Next week, we will resume the small groups. I pray that the facilitators are actually very excited. And my hope is that, you know, you will have a renewed vision of what God has called you to, uh, to do in the small groups. But the resumption, the kickoff for the small groups is, again, like a starting line, more than a finish line. Because what you'll do is that you will be meeting with the groups week after week after week. That's where we pray that transformation will take place. That's where we pray that community and friendships will grow. It doesn't just happen with a kickoff, right? It's the same with prayer. It's the same with Bible study. You cannot just say, you know, I'm going to pray more this year. You're not going to do it. It's just a starting point. So in, this, in as much as we would like to, to have big events and something new from time to time, we must remember that influence and impact happens after we embrace a life of steady movement in a life-giving direction that is undertaken one day at a time, every day, again and again. So we are called to be faithful in the shadows. We are to embrace repetition. And here's the third one. We are to seek an audience of one. This is the most important one. One of the reasons why faithfulness can be hard is because people do not always recognize us, don't we? Often, even without knowing it, we live for the applause of men. We, we want to hear somebody recognize and say, good job. Or somebody who will give us a plaque of appreciation at the end of the year. Or maybe a little bit of a bonus or something. Just to recognize the work that we've done. And, and without really knowing, we actually live for the applause of men. I remember the story about Steve Martin. You know, so Steve Martin is a comedian. He, he, he's, he, he's an author. One time he was in this banquet. And he was sitting at the very back of the room. His name was called because he won an award. And so he has to weave his way from the back of the room, through all the tables to get to the front, to get to the microphone, to give his thank you remarks. And while he was walking, people were standing up and applauding and applauding him until he finally reaches the front and he took the microphone and people stopped clapping. clapping. And he said this, he said something like this. That's the goal, isn't it? to try to get the, to the platform before the applause dies out. <laughs> now, I think he's onto something there, isn't it? Because the truth is, 
we often live for the recognition of men. So there is something actually that we can learn from Samuel here. Because here was Samuel, who did not, he was very human, okay? But he, we under, you will see that he did not live for the applause of men. He lived for an audience of one. Now, what we have read in chapter 7 was this synopsis of his life, his, the repetition that he did in his life over and over again. When we go to chapter 8, something happens. Look at what it says, chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. It says, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this what? This pleased Samuel, and so he prayed to the Lord. So it displeased him, right? Why do you think he was displeased? Look at verse 7. In fact, God himself gives us the answer. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected. Why did God say that? Because Samuel did feel rejected. <laughs> but they have rejected me as their king. There's this nice uh, contemporary rendering from the message. Let me read it to you from this same passage. Listen to how it's, uh, it's rendered here. It says, When Samuel heard their demand, give us a king to rule over us, to rule us, he was, he was crushed. How Awful, Samuel prayed to God. God answered Samuel, go ahead and do what they're asking. They're not rejecting you. They've rejected me as their king. So here's the implication. Here's what it's really saying. People didn't want Samuel anymore. They told him, hey, you're old. You know, you cannot hack it anymore. We want a king, just like all the neighboring nations. They have kings. We want a king too. And he was disappointed, right? After all, chapter 7, the one we just read a while ago, told us that Samuel faithfully discharged his duties as a judge. From Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah to Ramah, year after year after year after year. In fact, if you continue reading the rest of the chapters, you will see that this was actually in chapter 8. Chapter 8 was actually a turning point in the life of Samuel. It there's a change now in his role because they will now choose a king. And so he will not be the judge of Israel anymore. I'm sure there's a part of him that felt rejected and hurt. But Samuel understands what it means to have an audience of one because we're going to see it all throughout his life. In chapter 12, for example, um, this happens when there's already a king installed, King Saul. Here's what he says as part of his address to the people. He says, as for me, chapter 12, verse 23, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. In other words, Samuel was saying, I may not be the judge of Israel anymore, but I will remain your spiritual leader. I'm going to pray for you every day. I'm going to continue to teach you what is good and what is right. And what does that mean? What he's really saying is, I'm going to faithfully teach you again. I will go, continue to go to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and Ramah, and I will do it again and again and again. Yes, Samuel's role has changed. But he was able to look to God because his rejection and his disappointment in these people were not, what was, were not the things that he stood on. He stood on an audience of one. He looked to God and not to what people saw. You know, sometimes people will reject us even when we're faithful. And sometimes people will reject us when we make mistakes, right? I've, I'm sure we've all had a share of that. I've had on many occasions felt like saying, you know what, this is just not worth it. Let me just give up. Let me just throw in the towel. 
On, many, on certain occasions, I've held the sting of unjust judgment by people who were close to me who simply never bothered to hear my side of the story. And I'm sure all of us have had all experiences like that, right? It, it, it makes us feel like, you know, we want to give up, don't we? You know, God, this is not worth it. Lord, I, I've been faithful. I've done all the best that I can. But people don't see it. It's a thankless job. We can learn something from Samuel here. In chapter 8, it says that when the people wanted a king, he was displeased. But it also says, but he prayed to the Lord. In chapter 12, it says, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord. Samuel knew that God mattered more than everything everything else you know, I'm learning that le- I'm continuing to learning to learn that lesson that it doesn't matter what others say it's what God says that matters more I want to encourage you if you've made a mistake turn to the Lord he's teaching you something and if you've been faithful and, and no one is recognizing it then always seek an audience of one Because God sees it even if others don't. I love the way Os Guinness says it. He says, I live before the audience of one. Before others, I have nothing to gain, nothing to lose, nothing to prove. True, isn't it? I have nothing to prove to men. You have nothing to gain, nothing to lose. But as far as God is concerned, what God thinks is the most important. So the three challenges for all of us in this new year, as we reflect on our call to be faithful, is number one, let's be faithful in the shadows. Number two, let's embrace repetition. Number three, the most important, is always seek an audience of fun. I want to end with an illustration. Uh, in 1911, there were two teams of explorers who were in a race to become the first to reach the South Pole. And the first team was led by a guy named Roald Amundsen. He was from Norway. And the other team was led by a guy named Robert Falcon Scott from Great Britain. And here's the thing. Um, each of the team were seeking the honor of being the first to plant the, their country's flag in the South Pole. Now, and Jim Collins, in his book, Great by Choice, uh, contrasted the strategies of both teams. And he talks about what he called the 20-mile march. And here, here's, the, here's the scenario. We're talking here about 1,800 miles, 900 miles each way in, in Arctic conditions, not just racing each other, but fighting against the elements. Both teams had actually two very different strategies. The British team, led by Robert Falcon Scott, chose to achieve as many miles as they could possibly go when the weather conditions were favorable. So what they do is they go 30 miles, 40 miles, even 50 miles if the weather conditions were good. And then when the blizzard would roll in, they just hunker down in the tent and wait for it to pass. On the other, on the other hand, Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian guy, made it his goal to do at most 20 miles a day. That's why it's called the 20-mile march. 20 miles every single day regardless of the weather conditions and in his book Jim Collins points out the two mindsets during a particularly um, strong blizzard and he wrote it this is here's this is what they wrote in their journals during strong blizzards for Robert Falcon Scott here's what he said he said I doubt if any party could travel in such condition On the other hand, here's what Roald Amundsen said in his journal on a very similar day. He said, it has been an unpleasant day, storm, drift, and frostbite, but we have advanced 13 miles closer to our goal. So you'll see that there's two very differing 
perspectives. And, and for the British group, by covering as many miles as possible on days when, weather, when the weather was, was more favorable, Scott actually drove his team to exhaustion. On the other hand, the Norwegian guy, Amundsen, used the 20-mile mark not only as a goal, but also as a limit. So here's what they did. If they reached 20 miles on that day and the sun was still out and they still had the energy, they could still actually go for 15 more, they would actually stop. They would just stop and rest for that day and do it again the next day. Because in Arctic conditions, if the team was physically exhausted, it could actually be fatal. Because here's what happened. Amundsen, the Norwegian team, reached the South Pole and planted the Norwegian flag. But he also made it back to the base camp exactly as he had predicted it. On the other hand, the British team, they arrived at the South Pole to discover that the Norwegian flag had already been there. And tragically, Scott and his team were so exhausted, they, all, they perished on the return trip. They were just 11 miles short of a life-saving supply depot. And Jim Collins in his book asked a question that I, that I believe all of us should ask ourselves. And his question was, what is your 20-mile march? What is it in your life that you will awaken each day and you will go whether I feel it or not? Whether I like it or not, this is something that I will faithfully do as God has called me to do. What is that 20-mile march that God is calling you to do again and again and again and again? The power of slow and steady movement, movement in a good direction. It's not what we do one day. It's what we choose to do on repeat one day again and again to the next day. So what is your 20-mile march? Something that I'd like for you to think about. We are on the cusp of the new year. And I'm sure a lot of us have probably had time to sit down and think about what we want to happen for 2024. How will you bring yourself again and again in the service of God and of love for those around you as He calls you to be faithful? Because faithfulness is important because extraordinary lives are lived one day at a time. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the example of the life of the prophet Samuel. As we look at our lives, as we think about the past year, we do know that there have been times when we have given up. We have not been faithful to you. We have not listened and followed what you wanted us to do. For a lot of us, we, we, live, in this, we live this life based on our circumstances, based on our feelings. We do not live this life with an audience of one. And we pray today that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, will open our eyes to this starting point of this new year, so that we will be able to live a life of faithfulness, not for the worldly things that we want to do, but for the call that you have given to us, the tasks that you have called us to do as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we commit this to you. We commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs>